Hey, Scott from MyGrowthRings.com here. Here, once again, is my garage shop. And uh, welcome back once again. You know, when we last spoke, it was the end of December. Um, I had just purchased these tool, lathe tool sets back here. One of them is uh, from Amazon, actually from Penn State Industries. The other one I picked up from Harbor Freight. And I said, when we got back together in January, we'll take a look at those and see uh, how they perform and if either of them is a decent buy. So before we get started, it's really, really critical for us to understand how this equipment was designed and, and, and how it should be set up for use. Um, generically, if you were to describe a Shopsmith machine, you would say it's a lathe-based multi-purpose tool. There are other multi-purpose woodworking tools out there in Europe. They basically build a machine that looks like a table saw, and then they incorporate things like shapers, planers, jointers, uh, mortising machines, things like that, into that. So those would be a table saw-based multi-purpose tool. At its foundation, the Shopsmith machine is a lathe. So it is a lathe-based multi-purpose tool. Now, part of the problem that happened over the years, Shopsmith has actually been involved in a little bit of litigation from people that have gotten injured while turning. And uh, in almost every situation, it was a problem that could have been resolved if the owner had taken the time to understand and prepare their equipment properly. In fact, some changes were made about 20 years ago, and Shopsmith started on the assembly line doing a little more work to the machine because of a problem that was happening. This machine, when you opened up the owner's manual back in the 1980s, it would begin with how to set up the lathe. The problem was people bought the machine, they had a project to build, and they said, you know what, I don't need the lathe right now, I need the table saw, and they skipped ahead to the table saw. It's a lathe-based multi-purpose tool. The lathe needs to be set up properly. So Shopsmith started taking on to themselves the responsibility of building the base of this machine and having it in, in proper alignment. Well, depending upon when yours was built, depending upon the, the, the use or abuse it's had, you need to double check some things. So let's talk about those things. So what we have here is we have a pair of legs, base castings, lower tubes that are known as base tubes, and upper tubes that are called way tubes. On a lathe, the bed of a lathe is called a way. And the, uh, the base tubes are set into this casting against a stop, and there's a clamp, and that clamp is held in place by two bolts that are positioned between the two bench tubes. You want to double check that the, the, the base tubes are properly seated and tightened in place. Now, what would happen if they were not properly seated? It's possible that the legs could begin to flare out. It's possible that under pressure, with something pushing the machine left and right, that base could slide off of those base tubes. So what could possibly be putting it under pressure? Lathe turning. When we put a piece of stock between the headstock and the tailstock and apply pressure with that quill handle, we are pushing and actually pulling this machine apart. The, the next thing we have to look at is the way tubes and how they are set in place and locked in place. On this version of the Mark V, because it's less than 20 years old, there are set screws here on the top, left and right, that are locking the way tube into this pivoting casting. Uh, that's actually something that we were talking about, talking about clone machines recently. Yeah, I mentioned recently that I purchased a, a Total Shop. That's a clone of the Shopsmith tools that was made uh, back in the late 70s and, and into the 80s. It's, get to it here. There's, there's a Total Shop. And one of the things that Shopsmith actually learned from looking at these tools was they did something that was kind of clever. And that was they moved those set screws to the top of these castings. Okay, so that's something that Shopsmith incorporated into the Mark V and the Mark VII. So prior to that change, the set screw that would lock the, uh, the way tube into this casting 
is accessible only from the bottom of this casting. And the only way you can get in from the bottom of the casting is to lift the machine into the drill press position. So you may need to do that. You may need to lift your Mark V into the drill press position, use your long Shopsmith toolbox to get up in there. What I would do is I would loosen the set screw first and push down on those way tubes to make sure they are properly seated in the casting and then tighten the two set screws. Now at the far end, this would be at the top, if you're in the drill press position, you also wanna make sure that the tie bar is properly seated and tightened in place. Now we, we covered some of those things in a video on 25 hour maintenance of your Shopsmith headstock. Um, I'll link to that if you wanna check that video out. So now let's talk about spindle turning and getting the machine set up properly for that. On most lathes, the headstock is stationary, bolted to one end of the machine. On the other end is a tailstock that is movable. Now here with the Shopsmith tools, the tailstock fits into a couple holes in the casting and is locked in place with a little knurled handle. Uh, one thing about this knurled handle, if you turn it all the way to an extreme, you'll be pulling these little threaded ends inward. If you go to the other extreme, they go out. Uh, one's left-hand thread, one's right-hand thread. So as we spin it, they move in opposite directions. I always like to have these so that when I give that a spin outbound, if I go away from the machine like that, that's how I tighten. On the other end of the machine, it's the opposite. I spin it outbound to lock as well. So with that in place, we have a stop collar. When you bought your machine, it had two stop collars. I always remove one of them because I only need one to drop this down to the proper height. And that holds that in position. All right, so we still have a few things to do here. Um, I want to make sure that the center of this tailstock center is in alignment with the spindle. Um, I can put in place this dead center, also called a cup center. This came standard with your Shopsmith equipment. It goes here. I, I don't tend to turn with this, but I still use it quite a bit. Um, I could put my spur drive here onto the quill or onto the spindle, but I, for now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a drill chuck with a brad point drill bit on it. And this, uh, this will help me out here because it gives me a little more reach so that I can bring this headstock up close, extend the quill out, and I can get those two points to where they are just about touching. Now I'm gonna bring them closer together. And before I make any adjustments, I need to be sure I tighten the, the uh, headstock. And we, we talked about this in another video too, that when we tighten the headstock, the lock is actually lifting on the headstock. So if you can watch that point as I turn, I'll tighten it and loosen it, tighten it and loosen it. Can you see it moving around? Now, once it's locked, it's locked in the proper position, but we wanna be sure that it's locked when we operate the machine. Here, we can check to make sure that we've dropped into the proper height and we can tighten that set screw on the uh, the stop collar to get that in position. The next thing I wanna do is I wanna be sure that these are properly aligned left and right. And it, it doesn't hurt to give this a spin to make sure that our, our drill bit is centered in the chuck and not bent, we're good there. If I need to make a left and right adjustment, depending upon when my machine was built, will determine how I do that. Ideally, when this eccentric center this cup right here is set at zero, the points should be in alignment. The gauge on here is only accurate if that is aligned properly at zero. If I have to use that dial for alignment, then it'll be wrong when I wanna use it for misalignment. So depending upon when your machine was produced, we've got two ways potentially of making this adjustment. This tailstock was made with two set screws. So I can actually loosen the tailstock, uh, the set screw that's closest to you. That allows for a little bit of movement of that cup towards the back. If I tighten the front, 
set screw now, that'll lock it in place and that move that point a little bit towards the rear. If I need to go the opposite direction, again, I still have this set at zero here at the top. I can, with those two set screws, get that cup aligned. Now I said it, it depends upon when your machine was built. If you have a single set screw here, you're actually not aligning these points here. You're aligning them at the other end of the machine. Let's take a look at that. So this is not true of the Mark 7 because of the way the Mark 7 moves. But if I unlock this and raise this up, like I'm going to the drill press position, I have a very large set screw here that I can adjust. And what is happening there is if I raise this tube up and this one stays in place, that is moving the spindle towards the operator closer to me. If I lower that tube, that'll take the spindle on the headstock and move it further from me. Now, the first time I saw this, I thought, hold on a second, won't that throw everything out of kilter? I said to myself, self, won't, won't that be misaligning things? I mean, if, if I have those tubes twisted, when I move the headstock along, it'll, it'll move. And the thing is, no, what I'm doing is I'm taking out the twist that's there. If they're not in alignment, then it's already twisted. So that adjustment is something that you uh, should only have to do one time. All right, so let's get this thing set up for actual spindle turning. Um, for this, I would get rid of my chuck. And for this, I'm gonna use my drive center. I'm gonna use a live center, a ball bearing center. And I'm gonna use this cup center in order to mark my stock. So I take the spindle that I'm gonna use and I find the center. And I'm sorry uh, because I had to record this again. This has already been done, <laughs> but I use a center finder. These are very inexpensive. You uh, lay this on your stock and you draw a line from corner to corner. Um, if the stock itself isn't square, it doesn't matter. It will be the center of all four lines that you draw. And then you'll notice that I've driven both centers, the cup center and the drive center into that end. Now, why would I do that? Whether I'm using a live center or a cup center, I always use the cup center first. And that gives me a nice ring that the ball bearing live center is going to be able to run in. I don't ever want to hammer on this. In fact, I don't want to hammer on any of these. I'm going to use a rawhide mallet uh, to do this. And I'm going to put that on the center where I've marked it and tap it a few times. Ideally, you do that right over the lathe. I'm sorry, right, right over the lathe. You do that right over the leg of your workbench. So you're transferring the force directly down the leg. And uh, I, I do this on both ends. And then I also use my drive center to mark on both ends. Now, again, why would I do that? Because there are times where I like to swap this end for end. I do that particularly while I'm sanding at the tail end of uh, the turning process. And uh, I can really get a nice smooth finish if I flip it over. Basically, what I'm doing is I'm reversing the rotation. If you have a Power Pro headstock, you don't have to do that. You can actually reverse the rotation of your spindle. So we'll lock this in place and align that here. We'll extend the quill out and engage. I like to have a few inches of a few inches of extension on the quill. I will tighten the headstock lock. Put a little bit of pressure. Now, how much pressure? Notice the tailstock here. I can actually make it flex. Do you think I want that to flex? No. So I'll put a little bit of pressure against it, and then I'll back off of that pressure and then tighten this. I want there to be no end play or end shake at all. But at the same time, um, I don't want this to be too tight. No sense in wearing out any of my bearings or putting too much stress on the tailstock itself.
the next we're going to insert oh my gosh this machine what a mess i need to get that rust off of there just like i did my chuck um this post right here has evolved over the years back in the early days there were just a series of, of rings that were turned into this and uh, that made it convenient because you could just simply drop it into the carriage and it would go in and everything would work but the problem is um it was difficult for the carriage to grip that. So the first thing that they learned was if they ground some flat areas with a belt sander, that gave the, um, the pinion something to lock against. And so that's the way they make these now is they only put the rack on one side. They have a flat on each side ground in place. And that allows this to uh, lock it firmly. So we're putting this here into the uh, into the carriage, and oh, you know what? <clears throat> Here's where we take that other stop collar that we stole from the machine. We'll put it on here, just lock it in place for now, so it's out of the way. But once we get this positioned properly, we'll use that to hold it in place. So right there is where we're going to put it today. We'll talk about this next week, depending upon what tool we're using, what technique we're using, we'll determine where, what height we wanna position this. And now I'm gonna have this loose. The arm is now loose on top of the post and I'm gonna loosen the tool rest itself. And then we're gonna give this a little bit of a spin by hand and we wanna make sure being that it's a square, that we don't hit any of the corners. We're clearing on all the corners, but we're actually gonna be relatively close. I'm gonna tighten this at the post, and I'm gonna tighten it here at the tool rest. And then I'm gonna give this a bit of a push. And look at that, giving that a push, I was actually able to push that into the wood. So there is a little bit of play between the post and the uh, and the carriage. And I wanna be sure that I've got that tight so where it's not gonna slide in. And here we go. With that, I can slide this along and not encounter any problems. You may have the question, what's, what's the proper speed uh, for turning? Shopsmith has this printed right on a label on the headstock. Uh, it's also in the Power Tool Woodworking for Everyone manual. It's in your owner's manual. And it's just a starting point to give you an idea with that particular diameter, what speed would make sense. I tend to turn a little fast. So let's just give it a shot. Still not all the way down through, and uh, I'm using a roughing gouge here. If we're going for a true cylinder, we would keep going until these flat spots are completely gone. Now, one thing that drives me mad, and you see it in every Shopsmith presentation, they'll say, you can tell if it's round by laying your chisel on top, and if it jumps around, you'll know that it's not round yet. It's also a really good way of getting yourself injured. Just stop the machine, okay? It takes a second for it to come to a stop. You can inspect it and then continue on. 
All right, I think that's enough for this one. Um, obviously, this is fun. I can play all day long, but just safe setup of your shopsmith equipment. Take your time. Start with the manual. Just double check things. If you've never turned, now's a great time to make sure that everything is properly aligned and that you're operating safe. Um, don't forget, leave your questions, comments, cheap shots down below. We'll answer them midweek in a follow up video. And then next week, we'll actually do some experimentation with these sets. All right, make a great week.